um, this is a Kogi myth, myth of creation. And I love how it reads. First, it was the sea. Everything was dark. There was no sun, no moon. There were no people. There were no animals, no plants. Only the sea extended was everywhere. The sea was the mother. She was not people. She was not a thing. Mother was the spirit of the life that will be. Mother was thought and memory. And I am going to take these, these myths, these very deep, like really abstract thinking about what it means to be created and that thought and memory are related to our creation. Um, also, the Mesoamerican people imagine this being, this is the mother, this is Mother Earth that emerged from the deep uh, parts of the ocean. And she's a living, huge saurian that would have needed to be structured in a square or a round with directions to host human life on her. But that is a sacrifice, the first sacrifice that a living creature gave to sustain life. And it is an abstraction. We can, we can think of it as an abstraction of something that we already know. The earth is sustaining all of us and it's sacrificing herself and her creatures to sustain our life. And this is the way the Mesoamericans or the Colombians abstracted it. And this is the way art translated this thought, this abstraction into a story. So in the bottom, you see the three stones of creation are the three stones of the hearth. Like if you need to put a hearth and, and, and the fire in your, in your home, those three stones will sustain that first comal. And there it is. Then you see a mountain with a cave, but it's a mount. The cave is the, this like sea um, that sustains everything, this like, mouth. Uh, and then you see a pyramid. It is a man-made mountain. And on top of it, you see like a cross. It's a maize plant with the four corners already uh, marked. And then you see a flying creature also divided in four already structure, which is the heavens. And around it, you see the horizontal space, the four corners of the world. And in the uh, corners, you see the solstices. So this is really a vertical time and horizontal time. This was made almost 500 years before our era. Uh, this was made 900 years before our era, and it's again the earth that has been killed and its death uh, sacrifices herself so that the cosmic tree will raise up the sky and the sun on the top can start illuminating the days and years that, that follow the, this horizontal time. So the, the, the universe is imagined as three layers. The underworld, we call it the underworld, but it's the world of potentiality where memory and thought are kept. The cosmic tree that, that raises up the sky and creates the heaven and the surface of the air where we live which is Tlaltikpak. Uh, it means actually the surface of the earth. This is what happens. This is redone and redone through the centuries, from 500 BC to the 16th century when, when, the, when the already conquered Nawa people had to paint their myth of creation. They did, ex for the Spaniards, they did exactly the same thing. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about how Mariana takes these concepts into her art uh, in different ways. And we're going to be reviewing how these, how Mariana's art can be, if we would have uh, the possibility, it would be the third uh, time where these concepts are recreated and brought into materialization. So how this is done is, is 
Uh, and Mariana and I started working on an exhibition that it was called Intlili Intlapali. Intlili Intlapali means literally the black, the red, or black ink, red ink. Intlili, Tlili is that soot, uh, that black created out of soot, out of carbon. Or it means also the black, the colors. Tlapali means red, but it also means all the colors, just like in Spanish, color y colorear, no, um, it's it's the same. Um, and I put this image here because it's fantastic, but also because you can see that in Tlili, it's the black that creates all of the, the perimeter of these figures. So it's the line, the drawing, and the colors are everything that illuminates them. And this is the way to mention, to, to conceive, to materialize the abstract concept of knowledge, which is, I think, created by thought and memory, taking in the Colombian myth. So that is where Mariana and I started working on, to being able to translate this concept, her through her contemporary art, and me through my art history history and collaborating together. So um, Mariana and I worked on, on the idea that all these colors have meaning. And we know how these colors were made thanks to a 16th century document that is called the Florentine Codex because it's in Florence, but it, its name is La Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, the general history of the things of New Spain. Um, done by Bernardino de Sagún, a Franciscan, together with 22 Nahua painters, and that were already that were that were also um, writers, and among which four were master painters and and trilingual. They are called trilingual because they spoke perfectly well their language Nahuatl. They spoke perfectly well Spanish and they spoke perfectly well Latin and could translate both cultures. So these, these people are the brokers of these two worlds. They were translating for the Europeans, the world of the Nawa, and they were translated for the Nawa, the world of the Europeans. And by doing that translation, they created really what Mexico is today. And Mariana and I started like our exhibition from there and respecting what they thought that were sacred, these colors, and their processing of these colors. And so this is the cochineal that it's taken from the nopal. It's, it's, um, it's an insect that yields this amazing red. This is the flower matlali that yields um, a lot of different kinds of very precious blues. Um, I had worked with these two um, professors at the School of Restoration to recreate the colors and this is the way the blues are made. And the other part of, of what we were um, bequeathed by the Nawas is to conceive of the colors in two ways. The colors that are minerals, that are the last deter deterioration of a rock, no? that are really from the entrails of the earth, are different from the ones created uh, through flowers and insects that are organic. And these are painted to belong to the underworld. Under the water is the, the creator primeval underworld inside a cave of a mountain. It's also, and this is for instance, the red cinnabar or um, hematite. These are actually real pigments from Teotihuacan found in Teotihuacan in excavations by archeologists. And so these are the minerals. And um, this, it's a beautiful piece of the Museo Nacional de Antropología from Oaxaca, where you can see the underworld. No, it's, it's this monster, this first earth that it's floating on, on the earth and it has uh, on the ocean, it has the waters inside and the fish of the past generations. And that world is only illuminated by the moon and it's nighttime. It's the stars and nighttime where everything in that world will, will happen so that the sun comes out and it's marked 
by that energy. The cosmic tree that raises up the sky and creates these two colors, meaning night and day. So anything that is created has those two energies, the feminine and the masculine, the solar and the lunar, the telluric, watery, and the, and the heat and the brightness. So uh, here it is how the Florentine Codex created these, that you can have a, a, a cinnabar and a cochineal in a single flower because those colors are not only colors, they mean both worlds. They are painted because they are recreating and creating the world. And so the, that tells us that these are not only drawings or representations, but they are made to exist. They are made, so to speak, with the recipe of creation. So how, how, do, you, how do you bring this into the practice once you know this? That is uh, what we're going to be talking about. So um, these little patches of color that were um, the tests that um, when I created the colors with Lilia and Arturo, we, we tested them in these little circles of chemically neutral uh, cotton paper that were then analyzed in Florence. These are all the recipes we used. And this is a model created um, to, to envision how science and modernity will, will kind of extract that knowledge. And this was part, very much part of Intlili Intlapali for Mariana. Mariana created in that moment this amazing garden with this is the structure of the pre-Columbian cosmos that I will explain later. And then with Tatiana Falcón, um, who helped uh, collected all the, the plants that were used in the floor, mentioned and used in the Florentine Codex to create color. So in, in you can see cochineal, you can see indigo, you can see sacatlascali, you can see muitle, you can see all of them. And they are all uh, in this beautiful structure of time and space. And um, through Tatiana too, uh, we brought into Museo Amparo all these Minerals. So the world of Intlili and Tlapali in its own space and time was brought into the present by Mariana with this design for Museo Amparo. And the water yonder world, the mirror is right there uh, with the water on top. She also recreated the painters that gave us all the information, the painters and the processes. And we had all the paintings that Tatiana through uh, planting these plants and uh, thanks to um, almost an internship, but it was thanks to, to really her work with an indigenous Tintorera, she learned, and I think she's the only person who knows how to recreate these colors exactly. And so this room was dedicated to that knowledge bringing that knowledge into the present. And uh, as part of it, this is the Florentine Codex where all the information is. These are the little patches of color that we were, that were exhibited as part of the research. And this is a painting, a mural painting that Mariana painted. Uh, it is really the ending of the Mexica time because it's the death of the Axis Mundi of that world, who is Moctezuma. And, um, but all this painting, it's, it's painted with all those natural dyes that were recreated in the present. So this is a way of starting like the research through Inclilin Tlapali. Um, again, you just saw that in Mariana's great garden. And this is the first page of the codex called Fejervari Mayer, uh, because Fejervari collected it. Um, you see on top a sun, that is the east. And the tree that, that sustains no, that part of the cosmos with the two gods. On, then to your left, you will see the north. 
in the bottom you will see the west and to the right you will see the south if you start where the sun is to, to sorry to the right you'll see the first sign of the days that is sipatli and then you you count 13 dots and you will go to the next sign and you will count 13 dots and you will go to the next sign and like that and all of these dots and signs are 260 those are the number of days that the uh, tonal powali or tonal lamato tonal Tonali is the energy of the sun. Powali is to count. So it is the number of days that the sun influences humans. And it is almost like a divinatory calendar. 260 days are related to nine months. It would be the nine months that a baby stays inside the womb. But it's also a solar, a precise solar calendar where if you count, those 13 uh, spots, and you multiplied 13 plus four, the four corners, um, you have 52, which is the, the, the days of the, the, I'm sorry, the cycle of the year. And the 365 days are counted like this. I hope I have it right here, but if not, it doesn't matter with the solstices, but it is also a solar calendar and a yearly calendar. And if you bring it up, it is a pyramid. This is really the image of the vertical and horizontal time, the image of the cosmos. And those dots are so important, are not only important to count time, but are also the ways that in Tlilin Tlapali brought these colors into being, and you can see here, Mariana's Petlacoatl, the surface of the earth, the woven surface, orderly surface of the earth in a specific day. This is two layers of that surface of the earth. It's so fine. And she's using that uh, watercolor that really uh, takes the language of, of the flowers of this flowery um, colors that are part of the tonali of the images. And here is another one. And lastly, the woven earth and the entangled underworld. So it's, it's um, in its simplicity and abstraction, this is an amazing way of bringing all this knowledge together. And I gave you like the, the knowledge that pre of, of a world that it's difficult to get to know, that you need to really uh, read and study and think and dedicate yourself to, to understand, but it's not difficult to understand, it's intuitive. It's, it's just that Mariana is able to really merge these two, these two worlds in, in, in a very contemporary manner. Another way of, of merging the worlds happened in the 16th century. So that, that image of the Codex Feher Mary Major with all the, the, the vertical and the horizontal time and space, it's captured in this little icon of Altepetl, water mountain. It has the cave, as you could can remember the first cave of creation, and the mountain is alive. Those, those rounded shapes are usually uh, drawn to, to draw, um, your your arms where, where they where they bend like articulations and so you know that that is alive that pink it's so rich it's so alive and that is a mountain that would have the same base if you would if you would abstract it it has that four corners and it's vertical and horizontal time and inside the cave it's the watery underworld. It crosses the, 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 the blue and the uh, yellow waters are, are actually two actual rivers, but they are painted as sacred. And it is the place of origins for many 
Central Mexico people where those two waters cross, it is a magical place of origins. And in this map, it's, it's a map that was drawn in the middle of, of a legal dispute to, to say that these lands belong to the people of that town and they wanted to preserve it from, from, uh, from this fight that on land that happens throughout the 16th, 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 17th, 18th century, where a lot of newcomers started to own these lands to put um, ganado and, and use it for other purposes. And these were communal lands. So in this fight, how the painters paint their lands, it's with the same principles of creation. It is the same image from 500 BC to this one, just adapting every time to a new world. And this is um, a water mountain drawn from these maps by Mariana with that same, like that sacredness of water, that aliveness of the earth and that abstraction that comes from imagining the earth alive and just having some symbols. And again, the Tonalpohuali, here are the signs. There are 20 signs that are permuting with 13 numerals that are these uh, dots on top and the bottom. And so if you count them, there are 12. The 13 dot, it's the image that you're seeing. And it is really actually the creation of the world by Quetzalcoatl and Mitlantecutli, the earth, it's on. Uh, on the bottom, she is uh, she's dead, that it's transforming. She still has those dots of, of, of skin that are still in transformation, just as Mitlantecutli is. So all those processes of life are considered sacred and their energies are summoned um, through these paintings. This is a tonalamato like it's, it's in an accordion fashion and it would be read not in a linear way. It could be read many in di many different fold, folding patterns. And it was, so this is writing, but it's a writing that it's an abstracted story of the way the sun influences human destinies and its memory because it's kept there so that you can interpret the present. So it's thought and memory. And here it is, the Tonalamatl, with the four colors of the four corners of the world, uh, just creating this new form in, in space and time that it's such particular to that moment, just as the Tonalamatl is, and with the being able to, to shape it. And so this is a destiny. This is another one with all the symbols and all the signs and the 13 numerals, really a more depth, in-depth analysis of the Tonalamato, but the same uh, Asaros representation that it's very much part of the spirit of that. And again, it's, it's, it's like stopping time in a moment, but also in space. This is... Another one, um, really devouring time, this crocodile skin devouring, devouring time. It's very much what happens with the underworld where everything is kept there and everything is recycled and retransformed. And these two, this image really relates to that uh, possibility again. And these symbols are, are just incredible, um, almost like constellations of days, constellations that have different energies and different signs and are in, in themselves, just as the codices or the tonalama is, it's up to the reader to, to interpret it and bring a story to it so you can own it and, and read it and reread re it. So it has that beautiful, spirit of 
co continuing oral histories. And this is the Tonalamato um, at, M at the museum, MGK Siegel, um, with these structures of, of aluminum that Mariana put uh, on the walls and wrapped uh, throughout it. And this is the Tonalamato in Museo Amparo in Intlil in Tlapali with those dots that also refer to those circles of the colors uh, in the Florentine codex that we work together. And again, uh, uh, a more deeper look into the Tonalamatl is the work in Donde Estoy Va Desapareciendo. Um, this is a Tonalamatl that Mariana created. It's also a film. It is worth watching. Look for it. It's amazing. I cannot put film in, in, in this conference because it would not be easy to, if it doesn't work, we will be <laughs> in problems. But um, here it is. She writes in all the languages that belong to the codex history, because these codices um, are already in libraries around Europe mainly. They really became, um, in the histories of colonialism, codices are really capturing the knowledge of the other. Are really, they, all these books were burned, were destroyed. Uh, so memory and thought was destroyed for a people. And the ones that were preserved are not in Mexico, are mainly, we just have one pre-Columbian, now two, the new Discover Maya Codice in Mexico, we have two. The rest of the 15 codices, pre-Columbian codices are around the world, many in Europe, or all of them in Europe. And so it is very hard to, to see them. And Mariana imagines the the codex as alive because it's alive. She starts imagining from the moment, the, the sacred ritual moment of uh, killing the deer and transforming its skin into the, the support of the codices. codices. Uh, the, the deer, it's, it's a solar deity for many Mesoamerican people. So she starts uh, the film and, and writes this beautiful poem in many languages. So this is the moment of the kill and where, when the goddess is transforming, the, the deer is transformed into a goddess. This is the moment of the conquest where all se guardaba su historia, pero entonces fue quemada, se tomó una resolución. Conviene que la gente no conozca, no? So the, the resolution of burning these so people don't know nothing of these. And, and this is experienced by the codex, by the codex as a living being. And then this is a wonderful moment where uh, the two consciousness of these two worlds, as these two faces become uh, the knowledge that comes from studying them like us or like any other scholar in Europe where the codices go and leave and the, the knowledge of itself. And I won't, I won't have much more of this because this really summarizes it, but she then, um, now it is written in English and then it will be written in, in German and Italian depending on, on where the codices are. And all of these languages are part of the codex. And, and she incorporates all of this history of colonialism and, it, and, 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 um, and the libraries and studying them into the life of the codex because they, as she understands it, codices were made to, uh, as, as not as an object, but as a living, um, ancestor that holds memory and thought. And therefore all of that history is part of the codice, codice itself. And then we come to a concept that uh, Mariana has worked on a lot. And I think we had great conversations around it. And it's part of the Intlilin Tlapali because it shipped as a concept 
It's the only way we can understand through the through a Nawa concept, through the Nahuatl word, is shipla that we don't have. It doesn't exist in Spanish, it exists in Nahuatl. Also in Tlilin Tlapali doesn't exist in Spanish, it exists in Nahuatl. And words are concepts, they really are touching upon a different reality. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about this, but I just thought that this image really, it's so much. I mean, if I would have an Ishipla today, it would be this. I mean, it is really so much an Ishipla. Uh, so Ishipla derives from the verb Shipewa. It means to peel a skin, you Shipewa a fruit, or, or to, as it was done, as it was customary after war, you would flay the, the skin of the very powerful warrior that you capture and you will wear it, no? And so you become that other person. Another translation that it's still disputed, but I will also like to bring here is the, the particle X, which is, it's eye or face, but to say eye or face in Nahuatl is to, to say that there's a conscious being. The same concept that Baha il An in Maya is. So images are conscious beings because they see, because they, can, they have a face. So uh, another important uh, researcher, Alfredo Lopez Austin, I think he really pinpoints this and, and it is easier to understand that it is related to the notion of your Nahual, your Nahual, which is your animal spirit, um, which is the capacity of all powerful individuals to transform themselves into the identity of others. So for instance, if you are a powerful doctor, no, let's say, or shaman, and you want to, to fight a sickness, you can become that sickness. So you know that sickness so well that you can fight it. Or you, like this figure in it is, here, it has become Tlaloc. It has become uh, this uh, powerful deity that has, or, 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 or being deities. It's a very uh, Western concept. And and we think of Catholicism or, or Christianity with, with deity. And, and it's really very much about uh, the power to, to, cre to, to deal with the world, no? So that this being is transformed into a jaguar, but also a cave and the earth. And, um, and it's, it has these eyes and, and we call it Tlaloc because they call it Tlaloc, but we, we understand it like that. So it is an ishipla of Tlaloc. It's the only way Tlaloc, as the deity that, that governs uh, storms and rain, will be, come materialized is through the ishiplas. So it is the covering, the skin uh, that has this figure being transformed into that being. So it's not a disguise, it is really a ritual process of transformation. And more uh, recently, Viveiros de Castro, no? studying the Amazonian uh, thought and language and, 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 and in his um, anthropological work says that, and this is true for all the Amerindian world view that all of it is imbued with life. Um, there's not a distinction between our life and the life of a tree and the, the stars. Everything is imbued with life. We all have different shapes, different bodies. And that is the only difference. Our identity, it's really the exterior identity. And that through ritual can expand and um the clothing becomes part of an identity. So this, this little boy here in this disguise, he's a human being because the shape of the body is that of a human being, but he's imbued with life as any other tree and therefore, uh, or any other living creature, therefore he in this moment is a macaw. Um, so it's a very different, a much more fluid way 
to understand life and uh, power too, because uh, power is if you manage to transform and to come back and to understand the others. So this is so important as a concept also for all the history of, of colonial times. Now, if, if the Nahuas, for instance, here are writing a book in Nahuatl and Spanish and are painting with the their ship land, their ritual, with a style that it's really considered Europe, European, it is their ability to, to understand the other and transform into the other that gives them power. It is exactly the opposite of, oh, they were converted and convinced that their world was bad and now this world is better. But so Shipla can really help us to think through this uh, very, very uh, difficult human no? tragedies because they are still part of the tragedy of today. No? Racism, um, cultural hierarchies, etc. So this is a good concept uh, that the Mesoamerican world can bring into these thoughts. But these are the Shipla and a summary of the Shipla. They don't have to be just paintings. The paints in this painted Shipla are their skin, but um, also an Shipla is Coatlicue, this amazing stone. This is the mother of our gods. She sacrificed herself so life can, can continue. And this is the Shipla of that powerful sacrificial victim that is uh, the mother of all gods and creation. And here is Mariana um, in Ishitla. It is really like capturing the power of that, of the colors, of the rope that creates. It's, it's just, it's really, uh, I mean, it's such an Ishitla of the contemporary life. It is, it has all of these elements that we have been talking about and not the, the this proportionate figure and, and the arms and the rope creating a, a ritual image that it's a bundle of things where a human being is transformed into something other, but that life, it's imbuing all of it. Life and death, it doesn't have to be all beautiful, is she blessed as you saw with Guatlique? It has, it is the power of what one might call reality. And I love what what's the matter with you? I mean, where is his matter? No, what is the matter with you? It's an amazing way of also creating an Ishipla. And I think this water walk, it's the ritual and the imprint of that spirit. And it's also an ishipla of that moment in time. So I, I put it here, although I am not so sure if it could be understood as an ishipla, but ishipla it's a word and it's a concept that can that can really be uh, experienced and, and reflected. And, and I feel it, it, it is really important in this, uh, in this discussion to have those imprints as a shipla of those who walked before us. Uh, this is a study of, of the shipetotic, which is an shipla and it's the flayed skin and where the, the concept comes from that it's in the Art Institute. And this is the one in Basel and the skin and the position the ritual, and it's really brought into the present. And um, here we have um, another kinds of Ishipla. So mostly Alfred mostly it's a researcher in the 1800s. He went to the Maya, Maya he went especially to Kiriwa and was able to to put to do these paper traps, let's say, to create these molds of monuments there that he would bring 
into Germany to be in studies. And, and all of these copies are at the Ethnological Museum in Berlin and Mariana studied them and also studied the techniques to reproduce them and created, you have time to show yourself before other eyes. So it is, again, the shipla, that, that, that laying of a second skin, and therefore you show yourself to another eyes. And this is really very much about what I'm talking about, this colonialism, the study of it, how do we look from different points of views? How do we, uh, do we appropriate this knowledge or is this knowledge in itself by recreating it in itself, the shipla, its presence. So a lot of reflections on that. And she brings that technique to take uh, paper traps of trees for the Biennale, uh, Berlin Biennale. Biennale. Um, here's the paper trap with the same technique. And here are the mostly gessos, the paper traps, the photographs, and she brings them all together as ishiplas of the trees, of life, of the present, the gessos as reproduction. So it's copies or ishiplas. And, and she brings into question all of these two worlds and how they collide. Uh, and how complex all of this is. Here she is in Oaxaca. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about the agency of objects. And I name this, this is not a vessel because this is not a vessel. If you see carefully, this is a being, a powerful being. It's, it has two eyes in the rim. His nose has a nariguera that would have been gold and he has a golden necklace. And this powerful being, it's also a container, but it is mainly a bee. Um, so mostly studied Kiriwa's objects. You see these, these boulders, these huge rocks with the same shape that they had. They are not a rock, they are not a boulder. They become an ancestor. And they, that ancestor becomes swollen, like swollen by the earth. And so Mariana recreates this somorph and gives, gives it life by uh, carving all of these symbols on it. But how are these symbols going to be able to talk? Or how is this somorph and its agency going to be activated. And what she does is that she uses as, 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 as a tool for printing and creates this uh, body of work where that you can see um, on the walls. And so it is ex it's to have this agency that objects have. Um, and so the object is expressing itself through that. And the question of whose past and whose history, uh, it's very much in the minds of, of, of Mariana Castillo de Val. Um, and one of her first projects that I think is it's genius, it's, it's such a beautiful one, is who will measure the space, who will measure the time? Just as we started with the horizontal and vertical time, and space of the pre-Columbian. So in, in her project with these columns, uh, she merges these two worlds, the Brancusi endless column, which is perfect because it's endless. It's about endless time. And the world of West Mexican sculpture. And she merges these two opposite, but in a sense, when you see these two worlds, it, they are easy to merge together like formally and, and intuitively, you can see them together. And here they are, the columns at Sigen. And she works with the Cuatlicue Ceramics Workshop in Oaxaca. All of these, uh, um, the, the participants in the workshop experience ceramicists. Um, 
great potters, go to the museum, the Museo Tamayo. He collected, Tamayo is a, 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 a contemporary artist, like he's already, uh, he has passed, but he was part of, he was the younger generation of the muralists. Um, and he collected, he was from Oaxaca and collected many pre-Columbian pieces and donated them and created these museums. So they go there to study that collection, to choose and interpret that collection. And you can see the relation right there. You can see also the shapes here that are incorporated. And once they studied and cho everybody chooses their column, they're gonna tell a story um, the story of the world in a uh, uh, hundred days. They will each tell a story, will work together. There's also footage of the storytelling that it's fascinating. And they create these columns. Look, uh, the, 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 uh, the knowledge of these um, ceramicists really comes from a long-standing tradition. And the fact that they go and interpret the past like this, they also created um, a timeline of ceramics from before Christ to the present, including their ceramics. And uh, unfortunately, our, our INA, our Institute of Anthropology and History, um, came and closed the exhibition and said that they were not able to interpret the past, it was not their past. So, so that is something that happened and it was all recorded. And, but the process and the beauty of these columns and the merging of these two worlds, it's amazing. And with that, um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm finishing right here.